So as the masajid have been taken away from us, even if temporarily, it's dawned upon us how special those places are. But we also have our homes. And what you want to do with your house is turn it into as much as possible a place of praise. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, don't turn your homes into graveyards. So always leave some share of your salah, some share of your prayers for the house, even if you pray the congregational prayers in the masjid, so that your homes can also be places of barakah, places of blessing, places of prayer. And you know, subhanAllah, when people are always talking about how do we expel the shayateen from the home? How do we expel the jinn? And the reality is, is that you invite the malaika into your home with the recitation of the Quran and with the presence of prayer and remembrance. And those things naturally would expel the opposite of them, which are the shayateen, which are the devils. And so you want to have a strong share of your prayer for the home. And you want your home to basically be like a masjid in the sense that it's a home of praise, a home where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped frequently. And you want to have an allocation of that. Now, one of the things that's that's very powerful when you're thinking about the malaika, when you're thinking about the angels, is when you pray at home, you're not alone. Okay, so even if you're not surrounded by rows of people, you're certainly not alone. And Sayyid al-Musayyib radiallahu narrates that no one goes into prayer even if they're on waterless, desolate land, ardi fala, which we'll talk about. But you're praying all alone, except that an angel would pray to your right, an angel to your left, and angels would pray behind you. Amthalul jibal, angels the size of mountains are praying behind you. Can you imagine you're entering into salah, you're entering into prayer in your bedroom, in your living room, in your, you know, in your dining room, your office, wherever it is, and you think it's just you. And there are angels the size of mountains that are praying behind you as you're saying Allahu Akbar. Wouldn't that cause you to think a little bit more instead of going Alhamdulillah, you know, to actually think about the way that you're reciting and to take more seriously the moment. Obviously, the most serious element of it is that you're standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as you're standing before Allah, you have these angels the size of mountains that are praying behind you. And there is something special to praying alone and what that denotes in terms of ikhlas, in terms of sincerity. And so you find these two hadith, one of them from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu said that the prayer in congregation the prayer in Jama'ah is like 25 times the individual prayer. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, and Salah that is in Falah, in, uh, in the middle of nowhere, okay, which is the best way I think you can translate Falah, in the middle of nowhere, is like the prayer of 50 times the reward. Okay, so it's like twice the reward of the jama'ah. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned that Ya'jibu Rabbukum, your Lord, is pleased with a shepherd in the mountains all by himself, who calls out the adhan, who does the iqama, and then he does the prayer all by himself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the angels and he says, look at this slave of mine. Look at this one. Look at him. He's all alone. He calls the adhan. He calls the iqama. He makes the prayer out of fear for me and love for me. And he says to the the angel subhanahu wa ta'ala qad ghafartu li abdi wa adkhaltuhu al-janna i have forgiven the servant of mine and i have entered him into paradise why because of the sincerity of this person in the middle of nowhere in the mountains and if you haven't had the experience of calling the adhan in the mountains do it on your next hike inshallah ta'ala it's it's really an incredible feeling but you know the idea that this man is all by himself in the middle of nowhere on the outskirts of the city and still finds that clinging to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and announces themselves alone. So does that mean that uh, instead of coming to the masjid, I'm gonna drive out to the country and pray and I'll get more of the reward? No, these two hadith are talking about a person who happens to be in the middle of nowhere, not a person who goes and seeks the middle of nowhere for that prayer. And there is an implementation of this beyond just the sincerity of praying alone and the angels that are like mountains praying with you. You know, when you're on a journey or you're traveling and you stop at a rest area or you're praying, you know, in a place that's that's really, you know, uh, foreign, that's away, and you're doing that out of sincerity and it's just you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? It's a very profound expression of that sincerity. And Allah will not let you pray alone, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will surround you with angels the size of mountains that would pray with you. And Allah would announce to another group of angels that he has forgiven you for your sins and entered you into paradise.